Thank you, John, for that introduction. I bluffed him, didn't I? <laughs> Church, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to stand before you and bring you God's word. What a, what a privilege it is for me. And uh, my lovely wife, Karen, is here. Honey, I love you. She believes in me more than I believe in myself. And then my cousin, Chris, and his wife, Linda, are here. Chris and I are first cousins, but we married sisters. So we do have family tree, I promise, and it has branches. But when we read Emmanuel, we'd confuse people all the time with that. They'd look at us like, what? You married sisters? And they couldn't figure it out because they were from Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, about six weeks ago, Pastor Brad and we were having a staff meeting, and we were in there meeting, and he said, hey, guys, I'm going to be gone in the month of July. I would like for Scott, um, Jonathan, the bright yellow coat dude, I can't keep up with him, so, uh, and then uh, you, Kevin, to preach one Sunday. I thought, okay, and I said, I want the 21st, and Brad goes, you want to share it with anybody? I said, I have 15 minutes. My introduction's longer than that, so no, and so I've been thinking about what to speak on this whole time. And uh, I thought about, okay, I'm going to come out of Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, about how God gives us the spirit of, to be strong and courageous. And I went home after a men's Bible study and wrote that message, spent three or four hours writing it. And I didn't like the way it flowed. I thought, man, this message stinks. Other terms, sucks. And I didn't like the way it flowed. I didn't like how it was. And I'm thinking, uh, no, this isn't good. So I got up the next morning on Wednesday morning, and I said, okay, God, I don't like the way this message flows. I don't like how it's going. And God said, we're going to go a different direction. I said, okay. And so God led me to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And this is a very, very powerful passage of Scripture, one that if we can get a hold of, it will change our lives. And my title for this message is Fear, I mean, Faith Over Fear, or Fear Over Faith. So many times, if I had to ask you, which one do you live by, faith over fear or fear over faith, I'm afraid I'd have to say the latter one, fear over faith. I live in a lot of fear. Growing up in a home that was very, very dysfunctional, uh, you never knew how my dad was going to, when he came home, how he was going to show up, what was going to happen. It created a lot of fear in my life. Very, a lot of insecurity. So I started doing things to rebel against that. I know that's probably hard for you to believe that I'm rebellious. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I really have to work at being rebellious. And that's a lie from hell right there. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Lee. But uh, faith over fear. And I lived by faith over fear. I mean, fear over faith. And then God started doing a work in my life saying, Kev, you don't have to live like this. I'm better. You're better than this. I have a power that lives within you that doesn't give you a spirit of fear. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, Paul is sitting in a Roman dungeon, a stinky dungeon, chained there. He's awaiting execution. He knows he's going to die. He has started the church in Ephesus, and Timothy is overseeing that church. But Timothy has a tendency of being timid. Timothy has a, a tendency sometimes of running, not standing up, doesn't want to deal with stuff. And Paul is saying, Timothy, he writes him two letters. So this is the final letter to encourage Timothy to keep running the race in spite of difficulties and opposition. That's the way us, I want to encourage us, don't run from difficulties. Turn and face those dudes and opportunities, or opposition, I mean. And so listen to what it says. I want to read a couple of passages of Scripture to you, the same passage but from two different translations. Look at the New King James one here. It says, therefore, because Paul is talking to Timothy, in the first five verses, he encourages Timothy. He says in verse 2, Tim to Timothy, my dear son. So he looked at Timothy as a son. Then if you skip on down to verse 5, 
He talks about, I, I am remembrance of your sincere faith. He talks about how strong his faith is. And then he talks about his mom and his grandma. You have the same kind of faith as they do. I want to encourage you with that faith, he's saying. And listen to what he says. Then he says, therefore, because of this, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If we could use anything today, I think it's those last three. Because if you could really tap into the love of God, it's going to give you the power of God. And the power of God will give you that sound mind that you're looking for. We live in a culture today that these little devices, where did I put it? It's in my back pocket. Guys, these things will destroy us. There can be good, but they can also be bad. For what kids read on these things, my guys, my, it's straight from hell. Social media can, and the way that it attacks these men and women. Instead of being on this, we need to get into this. We need, to, we need to get into this. My question is, how much time do you spend on this or in this, and how much time do you spend in this? If I had to evaluate my life, I'm thinking, oh, Kev, you suck. And the reason why, I like this, but I'm going to do this. This has got a lot more going on than this does, but not really. If you really study out this Bible and fall in love with it, it has a lot more than this. A lot more. Now, look, I want to read the Amplified Version. As I was looking over this, I thought, man, this Amplified Version, I usually don't like it. I'm thinking that's a watered-down thing, but it's not. Listen to this. That is, a, that is why I reminded you to fan into flame the gracious gift of God. That inner, fi- inner fire, <clears throat> that special endow- endowment, which is in, in you through the laying on of my hands with those of the elders of your ordination. Verse 7, for God did not give us a spirit of fear or cowardice, I mean timidity or cowardice or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline, abilities that can result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. That's what we need. And if we can just get a hold of God's word, how would it change your life? I want us to first of all to talk about fan the flame. Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, you are gifted. You are empowered. But sometimes those gifts, instead of dealing with those, practicing those gifts, you run. He said, I want you to fan the flame. You ever been with a fire and the fire's about to go out, about to go out and you start stroking that fire? What happens? It gets brighter, doesn't it? It ignites again. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy, ignite those gifts. Ignite that gift. Fan that flame. He's telling him, you have a gift, Timothy. I want you to remember your calling, the spiritual gifts that God has given you, and use them. But Paul's not only telling Timothy that, he's telling us. He's telling us. I look at the church today, and I think, okay, I I deal with people. What is your spiritual gift? And here's what I hear a lot. I don't know. We have no idea what our spiritual gifts are. One of my spiritual gifts is evangelism. I'm an evangelist. I'm a prophet. The scary thing about being a prophet is you see everything in black and white. And you call things out. Sometimes my mouth gets me in trouble because I tell it like it is and it can get me in trouble I'm a prophet I also my one of my gift is administration organization but my biggest gift if I had to say would be number one would be mercy would you guys agree with that for you that know me that's a lie I'm not a very merciful person you know people do something I'm thinking man that's stupid How can you be so ignorant? You know, why do you do things like that? What is wrong with you? Or I will come after you. 
I have a warrior mentality. And my warrior mentality, I want to destroy. And so I have to learn to tone that down. When I thought about this title, Faith Over Fear, I thought, you know, the biggest thing wrong with me, I really don't fear people, but I fear other things. I'm not fearful of dying. If I die, guess where I am? I'm in the presence of God. Take me, Jesus. <clears throat> and so I want to encourage you to find out what your spiritual gift is. And then you put that gift to work. This past week, we were up here doing security, Lee and I and Andrew and some other guys, and just to protect our little kids. And, man, I saw people serving those little kids, loving on those little kids, teaching those little kids about Jesus. And you heard 45 of them came to know Christ. So I want to... I want to encourage you to find out what your spiritual gifts are and you use those gifts for the glory of God. It says here, he's reminding, Paul's reminding Timothy, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God. Timothy was a gifted, valuable man for the kingdom of God. But he seems, he seems like he had a tendency to be timid and had a timid streak in him. For this reason, Paul often encouraged Timothy to be strong and bold. If you study out First and Second Timothy, 25 times or 25 different places, Paul encouraged Timothy to be bold, not to shy away from confrontation, to stand up and be strong because of who Timothy was and the responsibilities he had to bear. This is what Timothy need to hear. he needed to hear. But let me ask you a question. We can talk a lot about Timothy. We can look down upon him. But if Paul was to come and say, Kevin or Jeremiah, Jason, I'm going to write to you. What would he say to you? What would he say? He would, I think he would say to me, I'm just going to be transparent. Kevin, you need to be more faithful. You need to be more faithful to me. You need to get in God's word more. You need to spend more time in prayer. I'm just being transparent, people. So many of us are like, oh, man, I don't want to hear that. But it's time that we become transparent and honest. And if Paul was to write and encourage us, what would he say to us? I know what he would say to me. Kev, keep on. Keep on. You got a call on your life. I've set you apart. But I want you to realize, every one of you in this audience this morning, you got a call on your life. Keep on. I almost had Nick put up the old 70s, keep on trucking, dude. Remember him, guys, the old people? But I wanted to say, keep on trusting. I was an old hippie, and as John told you, and I had a T-shirt, keep on trucking. And I brought that thing from Southern California to Hennessy, Oklahoma. And somebody stole it. <laughs> I, st I guess because they didn't have them in Oklahoma. You know, you guys were about 20 years behind. You know, I had long hair, and they made me cut my hair to get in the public school. My pants are about to fall off. And they're going, your pants are about to fall off. I'm thinking, oh, my God, where did my parents move me to? <laughs> made me cut my hair, all this stuff. But, guys, I say all that to say this. God wants to use you. And keep on trucking with Jesus. Keep on. I want to challenge us to to fan that flame, stroke that flame, stir up your spiritual gifts. Find out what they are. If you don't know what they are, you can go to our website. We have a spiritual gift test that you can take. Find out what they are. And then don't just sit back and go, wow, I'm a servant. Or, wow, I'm a teacher. And you do nothing. It's time to get in the fight. It's time to get in the game. Instead of saying, well, somebody else can do that, it's time to step up. But not only did he tell Timothy to fan the flame, but he's telling us spirit of fear. Look at the second point. God does not give us the spirit of fear. And I thought about this. You are not a failure when fear, timidity, and cowardice attack you. You're not a, you're not a, you're not, you're not a coward. 
A couple weeks ago on a Thursday, Karen and I were having plumbing problems. Thank God we have a guy that lives right across the street from us. And I went over and called him and said, hey, Jer- Jeremy, I'm having some prum- plumbing problems. Can you come over and look at our plumbing? Sure. I had taken it all apart. I tried- I'm one of those guys, I can take it apart, but I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't fix it. I didn't have the snake. I didn't have the devices. So Jeremy comes over with all this stuff. And he, and he fixes it, and that night when he leaves, it starts, the drain starts leaking. I'm going, oh, smokes. So he comes over the next day and fixes it. But that Friday morning, I woke up. I couldn't shut my mind off. And I'm racing. And here's what the demons of hell were telling me. You're not good enough to preach, Kevin. You're a sinner. You suck. You're not capable. You can't do this, Kevin. You need to call Brad and tell him to get somebody else. But you know what, church? Fear is a liar. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. And I thought, you know what? Just a reminder, I can't. But God can. I'm not able to. But God can. If you guys knew me before Jesus, you would think there's no way he's in front of a church. I didn't want to be in front of people, except when I played football, then I wanted my name called. But other than that, I didn't want to be in people, around people. I was a shy guy, didn't care about people. And then I married Karen, the social butterfly. And through Karen's gifts, she has taught me how to like people. So I like some of you. (laughs) She has taught me how to enjoy people, some of you. My wife, God, has changed us both. I'm a different person. Karen said, you are a different person than when I married you. And it's because of Jesus Christ. He changed me from the inside out. I went to church with Chris and Linda. They invited me to church, and it was a Baptist church. I hated Baptists. <laughs> Couldn't stand them. I thought they were a bunch of phonies. I would play sports with these Baptists, and they would tell me, hey, come to church with me, but they were out drinking beer, having sex, and all those things as I was. There was nothing different about them. I'm thinking, why do I want this Jesus? You guys are a bunch of freaking phonies. Chris's dad came to know Christ, and I saw his life change. And I went there and said, LD, what's going on with you? And he goes, Jesus. I said, nope, done. I said, Karen, let's go. We got up and walked out. Couldn't stand Christians until I became one. And it's when God does that. He doesn't give us a spirit of fear. The word here, not, it's absolutely not like No, it's strong, and it means this is not from God. I didn't give this to you, Kevin. I didn't give this to you, church. The demons of hell are bringing this into your life. It's a spirit of timidity. So many times the problem is because we focus on ourselves and our own human resources rather than, than on the Lord and his resources. And I, it's easy for me to focus on what I can do It's hard to focus on what God can do. I have to trust that. The picture is one of a state of fear because of the lack of courage or moral strength. Paul writes to brace Timothy up to assure him that there's no need for fear. Listen to this. With such a God above him, before him, and behind him, and beneath him, and beside him, and within him, there's no need to fear. God's everywhere. Timothy, why are you afraid? Kevin, why are you afraid? What are you afraid of? I got this. Stop fearing and start trusting. David said in Psalms chapter 56, 3, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2, I will trust and not be afraid. Those are easy verses to read, but man, they are hard to live by. We sometimes, we shouldn't criticize Timothy, but we criticize him. Timothy, what do you have to be afraid of? 
Ephesus was a hard town, very pagan, a Roman town, horrible. And, Tim, and, Paul, and Timothy was going to be the pastor. Paul had started it. He had discipled Timothy. He saw his gifting. And he said, Timothy, you got to go. How often we refrain from saying something or doing something because we're so afraid of what other people will think or say or do. Well, the spirit of fear has no right. It's a liar. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you forever wherever you go. He's with us wherever we go. I read an article a while, a while back from a Christian magazine. Five things Christians fear, but they shouldn't. Number one is shame. I don't do good when people try to shame me. But shame means here a, feel of, a feeling of embarrassment or humiliation. We're so fearful of that. We're so fearful of what are people going to think foolishness, afraid to look foolish in the eyes of other people. Number three, doubt or uncertainty, a lack of confidence, not good enough, I can't do it. We doubt what God, how God, what God can do with us. And here's a big one, opposition. I hate opposition. I hate it. No one likes to face opposition. We don't, like, we don't like it that people are, are opposed to us. We don't, we don't have to be afraid of opposition. It's hard, though. I mean, we could have a vote today. We're going to have toilet paper in the restrooms, and somebody in this church would vote no. <laughs> Guarantee. I've been to enough business meetings, I know. It, it would happen. But I think the biggest one, guys, not only opposition, is pain. We don't like pain. Pain is horrible. Christians are afraid of physical, emotional, and relational pain. We have trusted God with our eternity, but we don't like the pain here and now. And because of pain, we don't move forward. When we're afraid and living in the spirit of fear, who know, you know what happens? We stop the mission. We stop working. We don't continue on. When we're afraid and living in the spirit of fear, we don't use our gift. We don't proclaim the truth. We make excuses of why God can't use us. So true. I found myself in that spot four years ago. Karen and I, our world was turned upside down. And man, I was fearful. How am I going to take care of my family? What all is going to happen? It was scary. But God had it. That happened on July the 20th, four years ago yesterday. Three, three days later on my birthday, July 23rd. If you want to buy me gifts, I take them. Uh, but July 23rd, I was up early reading my devotion. And all of a sudden, church, I cannot tell you how the Spirit of God came into where I was. And said, Kevin, I got this. But you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to get rid of anger and bitterness and resentment and doubt. you got to trust me. But the pain that was there was paralyzing, was difficulty, was difficult. But God said, give it up. Then I started using excuses. Well, God, I can't do this anymore. And I was as happy at staying home watching Stephen Furtick and other guys in my underwear on Sunday morning drinking my coffee. I, was, I thought this was great. I didn't want to be around Christians. Didn't like you guys again. You guys are mean. And I thought, you know what? I'm done with Christians. I'm going to stay home and watch TV. And my wife comes and said, Kev, we need to go back to church. No. And then we started visiting Oakwood, some other ones. And then she said, well, I want to go to World Harvest. Heck No. Their theology is so different from mine. No way, man. Those are tongue-speaking freaks. <laughs> I, heard they raise, I heard they raise hands and once a month instead of passing the buckets, pass the snakes. 
And so I thought, man, there's no way I'm going to go to World Harvest. He goes, come on, Kev, I wanted to go there forever. I said, okay. So we come, not knowing what to expect. Walk in there, and I've known Kinsley forever. When he was in pilot training, he was at our house as part of our singles group, playing our piano, singing. We've known Brad and Tammy from around the, the community. And we walk in, and we're here about 15 minutes, and Karen said, this is home. I'm thinking, uh, give me a couple more minutes. <laughs> yeah. And guys, I want to say thank you. For the way that you believed in us. For the way that you restored us and helped us and brought healing to our lives. We needed it. I was hurting. Thank you. I was wounded. I was done. And then I tried to sneak out. Hey, Karen, we've gone to worship. Let's get out of here before they catch us. <laughs> we were like, you know, when you see the Kentucky Derby and the gate opens up and those horses are out, I wanted to be like that. Just get out of there. And I'm trying to get out the door. Of course, Karen's the social butterfly. has got to talk. <laughs> and before we could get out, Pastor Brad goes, Kev, don't leave. I'm going to talk to him. They get, oh, crap, we've been caught. And he talked with us and said, I'm going to take you and Karen out to dinner. I said, oh, no. They just want to get us involved at World Harvest. I know what this dinner is about. It's not free. <laughs> and so we go with them that Wednesday. And Brad said, hey, Kev, God isn't finished with you yet. I'm thinking, oh, no. And he started speaking encouragement to me and to me. We, I need your help. I'm thinking, no, you don't. I'm too hurt. I'm too wounded. I'm exhausted. It's okay. Come. And you guys have loved on us. So I want to say thank you. God doesn't give it a spirit of fear. Listen to this. Followers of Jesus cannot give into the spirit of fear or cowardice. God has called us to be bold. It's time we become bold and we share with what we believe and we stand up for that. I mean, we've allowed our world to come over, come in and take over. And you can see what has happened to our country because of that. You can see what has happened to our children because of that. You can see what's happening to us because of that. We got to quit being cowards. It's time we become warriors. It's time we take up the armor and the cross, and we go forward. But see, the third point is a spirit of God. Instead of fear, God gives us love, power, and a sound mind. When you look at those three, as I was studying this out, I looked at it how God put this in order. First of all is love. When you learn who you are in Christ and how much he loves you, that will bring power. And then when you realize the power of God and whose you are and the power that you have because of whose you are, it will bring a sound mind. And you and I live in a culture today where we need a sound mind. Mental illness is out of control. And I think a lot of it has to do with these. Really do. I think we need to somehow get off of those things. And I'm talking to myself. Sound mind, is just, it's crazy what's going on today. I'm glad I was a youth pastor a long time ago and there wasn't iPhones or any kind of crap like that, social media. I think it was a lot easier. I feel sorry for Brittany. She has to, I mean, being a youth pastor, it's hard enough being a youth pastor, but then what she has to deal with by being that youth pastor and what her children are dealing with. See, God loves us as his children. Power comes into our lives when we know who we are and whose we are. Demons of hell are attacking the children of God because we don't know who we are and we don't realize the power that we have because of Jesus Christ. And we live in fear. You know, love is a central theme to who God is. And we are called and what we're called to do. Yet this love that we are called to have 
we are incapable of producing on our own. The Spirit of God produces it through us. And this love will not only change my life, but the people around me. It will not only change your life, but it will change those around you. I've seen it at work a lot of times. I've watched because God loves me and I, I talk about that with other people. Hey, I watched God use that to soften their hearts. When we, realize, when we realize how much God loves us, it gives us power. Listen to what 1 John 4.18 says. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. That is a powerful verse. And if you're looking for a verse to memorize, I would challenge you to do that. But not only God give us a spirit of love, he gives us a spirit of power. Fear can paralyze us and, and hinder our ministry. The spirit of fear, the spirit of power equips us to overcome fear and step out in faith. Let me ask you a question. What has fear kept you from doing? It's kept me from doing a lot of things. Stepping out in trust. God, I got to trust you. How has it paralyzed you? Robbed you? Kept you from doing what God has called you to do? It's hard. Fear is hard. It's difficult to overcome. The power isn't just physical strength. It's a divine power to face whatever is in front of us. Karen and I and our daughter Sharon, on December the 5th, 1986, we were flying to Albuquerque, New Mexico to view on, call, on, a, on a call to be their youth pastor. And I remember getting up early that morning and going out to an oil field location. I was scared. I was just a volunteer. And then all of a sudden, God, the pastor calls, we want you to be our youth pastor. I'm going, oh, my gosh. So I'm out on the oil field location early, early in the morning. And God said, Kev, when you go, trust in me. When David faced Goliath, what did he do? He trusted me. And God said, I'll defeat any giants that come against you. You got to trust in me. And that was a hard church, folks. I don't think I ever confronted so many people in my life. One guy came to us. We're having a youth group. And he said, you guys are playing drums. And I'm thinking, most we have is a keyboard. What are you talking about? No, we're not. Had to confront him. Other people. Followers of Jesus have, to have, have the spirit of the living God within them. And they have the strength and power. We can walk through the life unafraid. We can walk through this life unafraid because we have the power of God on our side. See, when are we going to realize that? You got the power of God on your side. We got the love. We got the power. But then God comes in and gives us a sound mind. The term sound or self-control or sound mind refers to a disciplined and, and self-controlled mind. God's Spirit empowers believer, believers to, what, approach life with clarity and sound judgment. But the problem is, so many of us are not only a slave to fear, but we're also a slave to our desires. It's a double whammy. Our des we're, not only are we afraid, but then our desires come in and take control also. We think we're free because we can do whatever we want. But, with their act, but you're actually entrapped, controlled by what the flesh wants. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 10.5 says. Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing, look at this next sentence, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Let me ask you a question. Do you control your thoughts or do your thoughts control you? I'm afraid so many of us in this room, their thoughts control them. 
Your thoughts have power over you. Your thoughts keep you from doing what God has called you to do. Remember those thoughts? Come, they start bombarding. You can't do this, blah, blah, blah. And I was trusting in that instead of in God. Followers of Jesus do not need to be a slave to anything. Through the power of God, we can break free from the things that once ruled our lives. We don't need to be tossed around by our impulses, thoughts, or actions. We can live free. We can live in freedom and in God's power through us. Don't you want freedom or you want fear? They both start with an F. Which one do you want? I want freedom. I want to be able to say, I'm free, not because of me, because of Jesus Christ. I'm free. How 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7 applies to your life. Reassuring believers that they are not left to face challenges and fear and timidity. Instead, we are equipped, equipped with the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. This empowerment comes from God and is meant to guide believers in their thoughts, actions, and relationships. Even in the face of difficulties, Christians, we can have confidence because of the Spirit of God that lives within us. I can stand boldly before the throne of God or before anything else because of Christ. What did King David say? The battle's who? The Lord's. Church, the battle's not mine. I'm going to get defeated every time. The battles, the Lord's. See, Timothy was facing a tough road ahead of him. He was going to face challenges and be tempted to bail on what God had had for him. Paul's words in 2 Timothy 1.7 was an encouragement to stay the course. But Timothy was not to do this on his own strength. He has to look to God and the promises. And the promise is, if you do that... I will, you, you will have strength, love, and a sound mind. In other words, God will give him everything he needs to get through whatever is in front of him. The same promise is true for us today. I don't know what is in front of you. It may be something scary, difficult, uncomfortable, or intimidating. It, may, it might seem like it's imp- it is impossible to get through. And on your own, it may may very well be. But with God, you can and will because nothing is impossible with God. You believe that, church? The meaning of 2 Timothy 1.7 challenges us to look to God for our strength. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 12.9 says. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul was telling us in our weakness, God is strong. When something, when God has called you to do something that seems impossible, that's when God steps in. When you're weak, he is strong. We we must admit our shortcomings and look to God. He will sustain us. But you know what? It's a scary thing to admit your shortcomings, isn't it? It's a scary thing to admit what you're really going through. What are people going to think? I've come to the place where I don't care. My secretary, when I was at Emmanuel, used to walk in and say, Kevin, your giver crapper's broken. You don't care. And I said, Candace, it's not that I don't care. It's because I realize what God has called me to do. And there's a difference. I'm not going to allow fear to come in and take over and to control me. How do you apply 2 Timothy 1.7 to your life? I want you to listen to this. Focus on God. Lean into his spirit. What I mean by that is it's time that we invest time in your relationship with God. What does that do? Connect with him regularly. Study God's word. Take a prayer walk. Journal. Lock yourself in a closet and pray. Write your thoughts in your Bible as you read. Go for a drive. Pick up a devotion. Take a hike. Just spend time with God. My family has a ranch about an hour from here, 2,200 acres. And I love going out there a lot of times by myself. My wife can't understand it. 
I get on a side-by-side, and I just take off. I'm thinking, okay, God, where are we going to go today? And I'll make my own paths. Ryan was with me one time and his family, and I had to run over a tree to make this path. And I, I, but I took off, and we get on top of this one hill, and on top of this one hill, I can see everything below me, what we have, but also what the people have beside us. And it's beautiful. And I just get there and pray. And God, you know what? I need you. I need you, God. Thank you for this beautiful place. But I know the condition that my life is in, God. And I need to spend some time with you. And then in the mornings, I'm out there by myself. And I have my Bible. And I'm looking at and my phone. And I'm looking at the, where the lodge is. Where, then there's a pond right there. And the animals are coming in. And the peace and just the Spirit of God. Hey, Kev, I got gotcha. you. It's just awesome. Then I have my 300 blackout. Think if an alien shows up, would it put it down? <laughs> no. But, guys, I can't tell you just the presence of God. I do that wherever I go. I get mad sometimes and drive it and get in my truck and go out into the country and say, God, We need to talk. I am ticked off at you. God, you suck. And God is looking at me like, okay, let him go, guys. Let him go. Then after a while, son, are you done? Yeah. You feel better? Yeah. I'm sorry, God. And he reels me back in. But he wraps his arms of love around me and says, I love you. I'll never reject you. I'll never abandon you. You're mine. See, each of us is uniquely wired and will connect with God in different ways. But find a few ways that help you to connect. Then do it regularly. I remember when I came to know Christ. Three days old in the Lord, I knew nothing about him. Except three days ago, I accepted him. And I laid my Bible. I'm at an oil field location out east of Bison. I can still picture that location. And I'm out there, and it's about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And I'm out there, and I lay my Bible on the dash. you got to realize that was something new for me. And I said, God, I know nothing about you. You're a stranger, but I want to know you. And church, I cannot tell you the power of the Spirit of God that showed up in that truck. I mean, it was so powerful. And I'm going, oh, God, what are you doing? And God said, Kevin, you spend time with me every day, every moment you have, and I'll teach you who I am. And he did that. I'm a changed man because of the power of God, because of the love of God. I have a sound mind because of him. And I want to encourage us, church, to have that. Faith over fear. But if I had to use three words to sum up this whole thing, it would be this. Trust in God. Trust in God. Trust in God. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to think about what we've just talked about. That God doesn't give you a spirit of fear. What fear are you living in? What has control of your life? What fear has control of your life? I mean, they're like, it's so powerful that it controls my thoughts, everything. Has a stronghold in your mind. A demonic stronghold. What fear is that? Give it to God right now. Give it to God. God, I can't overcome this by by myself, but you know what? You can. Maybe you need to be loved on this morning. Maybe you're like, man, I just need God to love on me. I need him to surround his arms of love around me and show me how much he loves me. Show him, show me how much he cares for me. Ask him to do that this morning. 
Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You better be fearful because you will spend eternity in hell without Jesus Christ. See, God puts, I mean, the devil puts blinders on your eyes like he did mine. I couldn't see the truth until he took, he removed those blinders. And I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, before you leave here this morning, I want you to talk with myself or some of these people that will be at the front. Hey, I need Jesus. Maybe you're a Christian. You've played the Christian game long enough. It's time to come home. It's time to say, Kev, I want to come home. I'm tired of living a defeated life. I want to come home and be the king, I mean the kid that God has called me to be. Father, I thank you that I'm your child. Father, I thank you that you are so awesome and that you love us more than we could ever understand. Father, you remove fear and doubt and insecurities. And I pray that there's somebody here this morning that's dealing with that, that you'll break through whatever is keeping them away from you. God, that you'll set the captive free. Father, that you will blow things up to get to the people you love. Father, I pray for them that they will no longer live in fear, that you'll break that stronghold that's from hell, and that, God, you'll come in and they'll understand how much you love them. I pray that you'll open their eyes to see that. I pray that they'll realize how much you love them, and through that, Father, the power, your power will come into them And then, Father, that you'll give them the sound mind that, you know what, I need to think clearly about Jesus Christ and what's going on in my life. God, set us free. So many times it's from ourselves. Help us. Help us. But, Father, if there's somebody here this morning that that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, God, I pray you'd open their eyes to see that you'd remove the veil and they could see their lostness without you. You would drive them to their knees, Father. They would see their need of you. And God, that they'd put their faith and trust in you, Father. I pray you would bind the forces of hell that want to keep people away from you. Be with us, Father. Thank you for how much you love us. God, you are so awesome. I'm so thankful that I'm your kid. Probably the biggest kid in here. But you know what, God? I'm your kid. And I'm thankful for that. I love you. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask us to stand. I'm going to ask our prayer people to come forward. If you'd like to talk to somebody, these men and women are here at the front are available for you to talk to. They're here to help you. Don't go home from here this morning and allow what has been said just to escape and be gone. But allow the Spirit of God. I pray the Spirit of God pours out on you this morning and you can't leave here until you get right with God and right with one another but you confess what is going on to these people just love on them but if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior come and talk to myself I'll be in the foyer or one of these people down here we want to introduce you to somebody that is the greatest person you can ever know his name is Jesus Christ and he will change your life I promise you that because you know what? I went from being a hippie to a Jesus freak. (laughs) And a Jesus freak is a lot better than smoking dope, believe me. I smoked dope on a Monday and met Jesus on a Tuesday. And my life was transformed overnight. So you know what, guys? I love you and thank you. John?